And with that, I'm going to pass things over to uh, Nigel so that he can start his session today, Azure SQL DB features to make our lives easier. And let me make you presenter, Nigel. One moment sure, here. No problem. And then I'll get myself muted here because apparently I get a lot of backgrounds on today. <laughs> one second. Yeah. Okay. And then one thing for everyone, as uh, we go through, if you do have questions, please type them into the Q&A, and when we get to the end, I will come back on and ask those questions for Nigel. Thanks. Okay, great. And now to mute uh, myself. Wait, before you go, are you see my sure. screen? Uh, let's see here. Uh, I see that you have permission, but it's not coming through yet. Uh, okay, tell me. Show my screen. Uh, yeah? Now? Yep, now it's coming through. Okay, great. All right. All right, everyone. As Jason said, good afternoon, good morning, good night to wherever you might be. Um, just want to start off by introducing myself. It's been a while since I did a online presentation, so um, Please, by all means, if I'm going too fast or I'm not going fast enough, let Jason know and Jason could let me know, all right? Um, just some quick information about me. I've been a data platform MVP for the last six years, um, focused mainly on um, database administration and performance tuning, but I dabble a little bit into the BI world. Um, so as you can see, I did some stuff with Solid Q and reporting services. Um, I also lecture at a local university. I run a local chapter in Trinidad and Tobago. So for those who do know me, I didn't even mention that I'm actually from Trinidad and Tobago, which is very warm right now. Um, so it's like living in a vacation land. All right, so if it is, you have any um, questions for me, by all means, you could email me at nigers.sami at software1.com. Um, I currently work there as a senior IT consultant focused on data platform, of course. And even though I have my blog here, it's been centuries, I feel like, since I last blogged, right? So if you go there and you don't see anything up to date, I'm very sorry. Um, I've been trying to get back into it, but time has been very difficult, okay? Um, so let's get started. First of all, I like to start off by managing expectations. This session is going to be a level 100 to 200 session. Um, just to let you know, I'm not going to go deep dive into anything, particularly mainly because, um, one, it's very difficult for me to have set it up remotely. Um, so I decided to just go to a level 100, 200 session. Um, I'm not going to cover all features because this one is really about highlighting what is available to make your life easier. There are other features that I might leave out, but if you're interested in it, by all means, highlight it to, to, to us in the questions. And if there's anything um, in a deep dive that you want done, we could always consider it for later on. So this will help us um, kind of understand exactly what you're looking for. Um, I'm hoping that most of you have like some basic knowledge of Azure SQL DB, so when I mention certain terms, it's not going to lose you. However, again, because I don't want this to be a waste of your time, if it is you need me or Jason to explain something, um, just enter it into the chat, right? Um, and then the, the benefit here is for you to also come away with understanding your role in the Azure SQL DB space and the capabilities, capabilities it provides to you in your space. Right, so my agenda is going to be very short. Um, usage and benefits. So I'm going to touch it from different aspects of how you work or where your your area of expertise or your your focus in the business. And then I'm going to talk about the features that um, I like, as well as things that I've seen come out recently that I think is beneficial to to most people using it. Um, I'm going to do a small demo, nothing big, just to kind of show you where you could find some of the things that we talk about features-wise um, from the portal and both from um, Management Studio. And as the, the description said, stretch DB is something on, on the list. However, um, when I created this um, description, I highlighted stretch DB because it's something that I really enjoy and I really like. but. Um, there were not much improvements done to, to 2017, and then um, Microsoft um, had some 
issues with it from customer side so I'll talk about that when I when I bring it up and show you the demo um, so at least you understand the benefits and then some of the shortcomings that we deal with okay um, so let's get into it here now um, starting off so understanding Azure SQL database you know when you think about it um, Microsoft is always saying cloud is the way to go a lot of the features and capabilities are what we call cloud first and then on-premise after so that's Microsoft mantra um, so they've been pushing a lot of features and capabilities in the cloud and one of their flagship products which is Azure SQL database right they've been highlighting these scenarios as ways to implement it into the workspace right um, while these things are just a lot of market in terms of Microsoft views, what I thought would be beneficial is if I broke it down to you um, a little more, right? So I'm going to go in here with understanding your role in the business and then understanding how it could benefit you. So first of all, we talk about the decision makers. So the managers, directors, people in charge of um, what solutions we should implement. Um, at the end of the day, the benefit to you is saving money right what it is that you're going to move to Microsoft there and then when you move to there you're going to save time from your resources so they could focus on something else that's still going to save you money um, what I highlighted here was migrating the right load um, the company I work for which is Software One is a licensing company so even though I do um, technical services for them a lot of my customers um, start off reaching out to me because of their cost problems right and as most of you will know Microsoft SQL Server licenses even though it's great it's not very cheap so what you have happening is that a lot of times if you could leverage Azure SQL database you realize that you save a lot of money so some of my customers who happen to install an instance somewhere and then forget about it and have a database that is very small on it they don't see any issue with it because of course performance wise is not a problem and of course um, in terms of storage is not a problem so there's no issue there until Microsoft come knocking and say hey let's audit you and see how much SQL Server you have running and then all of a sudden you're paying a hefty price for a small database that you actually didn't even need to pay for um, that amount of money so um, a simple thing as migrating that database to Azure SQL database can save you a lot of money from a licensing standpoint but also from the the time and the management side of it which will then get to the point of the administrators um, a lot of people as administrator I was an administrator for many years we have redundant tasks the only way to get away from redundant tasks is to find some way to automate it or make it done faster by some scripts and while that is also beneficial to us, it is still something that we have to do. What Azure SQL Database offers is a capability to avoid us doing a sort of everyday task that we are accustomed to doing, whether it is automated and just checking to see that it run, or even um, running a simple script. Um, they take this away from you, and while it is, a lot of my customers were concerned um, about, hey, does this mean that I, I don't have a job, I don't have a place here, the answer is no. The data platform um, stack has improved and in, in, in increased a lot, which means that you now have a lot of more options available to do things for you. So if it is you're not doing backups and you're not managing your MDF and LDF, it just means you could focus more on understanding how to optimize your performance or maybe um, a high availability solution you know so it doesn't mean that you don't have things to do it just means it takes a really boring monotonous task that that you have to do every day or every so often and gives you more time to free up to focus on things that will improve you as a DBA as well as improve the business right and the last one um, developers which um, in my region, we don't have a, a large number of people that want to be DBAs. Um, what we have is what we call accidental DBAs, which I assume most of you will be familiar with, but it came from the concept of me being a developer and having to set up a database, which means that I then have to go request the server 
install SQL Server, set up a database, and then be able to do my development. As time progressed, because I was that guy that did those activities, I was put in charge of the DBAs and then eventually became a DBA. So um, now with the concept of Azure SQL DB, you have the option of creating a database a lot faster without having the request for hardware, as well as knowledge that is necessary to set up a SQL Server or even understand how to properly create a database with the configurations necessary to avoid future issues. So you as a developer now can focus on development and just set up a simple DBA with Microsoft just asking you a few questions and a wizard to help you get to that point. All right. So um, most, I'm hoping that you know people here are in one of these three um, areas, if I missed any and you want to highlight it in the chat, Jason could always highlight it to me and maybe I could highlight it to you how it could be beneficial, how Azure SQL DB can be beneficial to you, right? But basically these are the three areas that I see it helping you. Um, and now I'll talk about some of the features that actually get you to this point. So first of all, um, you will always see this Microsoft slide talking about the offerings that it has. While it is awesome that they say this, what I want you to understand is what this provides to you as a feature. It might just sound like something simple, but it is also helps you not have to deal with that will in your environment. So I'll start off with the SLA, for example, 99.99% uptime. Um, in some areas, what I recommend to customers, if you're using Azure SQL database, you can offer this SLA to your customers as well. This is backed by Microsoft, and this is because they have now redundancy in place to cater for if something happens to your Insta on your database, to bring up a copy of it immediately to keep up to this SLA. The benefit to you is, one, you could offer this SLA to your customers, as I said, but then also, if you think about it, it is a form of ensuring some level of high availability that if you had to do it on your environment, would cost you a lot of money, right? Or cost you, uh, not a lot, but at least cost you some level of money, and at the same time, cost you time in terms of creating, maintaining, and managing it. So even though just the 9%, 9.99% uptime is understanding what they do and the value to is, is it helps you the high availability options as well as um, giving your customers some level of assurance. Um, in terms of performance, the scaling up capability is actually fantastic. Um, if you had to do this on-premise or in your environment, it means either moving to a different server or stopping other activities that is happening on your server in order to hand have this capability happen on your environment. In this world, what you can do is basically just go to the, the option and choose what kind of performance you want and size and pay for it at that time, right? After whatever it is you're doing, so let's say for example, you have a big heavy processor that happens at the end of the month, having a server that just handles that load for one whole month right, up and running, but it only handles it at the end of the month, is kind of wasting resources. So in this case, what you get is you get to scale up at the point in time and then scale on after. And what make, what make what's the benefit of it is how easy it is to do it. So in my demo, I'll show you where you can go to scale up and scale down. Um, if you're familiar with Azure SQL database, you'll be familiar with the tiers, right? And long ago, it would mean switching tiers. Now they have a new GUI in the, in the portal that allows you to um, do a little more scaling to adjust, not to not make one adjustment and adjust the CPU and storage, but gives you the options to adjust your CPU and storage separately, All right? Um, point in time restore, geostore and active restore, again, high availability options that are very easy, I would say more or less click, 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 to get done, where if you have to do that on your own environment, on premise, it will just take you a week, two week, without considering how much time it takes to procure hardware, as well as paying for licenses, right? Um, when it comes to compliance, again, you don't have to worry about that, you just have to verify that Azure has the compliance that you need, and 
you don't have to go and set up anything to ensure that compliance is there. Auditing is also available on Azure SQL DB, which right now a lot of my customers are clamoring for. It's just a matter of turning it on and then seeing where you want to store your results to get it done. Um, and in terms of the flexibility, as I said, instead of paying for something for a whole month or having something for a few years, you could just pay for what you use at the time and then um, delete it if you don't need it. From so a developer standpoint, you spin up a database, you test something, you fix something, you, you implement something, and then after that, you just delete the database. You don't have to worry about paying for it afterwards. You just pay for it at the time that you had it. Um, from an admin standpoint, which I normally tell most people when I do presentations, because of the whole mantra of cloud first and then on-premise after, I recommend most people that if they're interested in a feature or a capability, it's easy to just spin up Azure SQL DB and test the feature, test the capability, and then delete it and shut it and get rid of it. That way you don't have to go and set up uh, a server, an instance, um, then figure out exactly how to implement it on-premise. You just take a few minutes, spin up the Azure SQL DB, do the testing, and then you're done. Okay? So, um, point in time restore. Based on the tiers that you select, what Microsoft does for you automatically is backup, right? And give you tension policy. So that way you know now how long you have to store, you have this backup stored for you and you allow this point in time restore. While that might not sound like a big deal, for most people that means it saves you from managing your maintenance plans, right? As well as considering your storage. Where are you storing these backups? So you have to create a whole backup strategy. You have to manage your maintenance plan. And also, you have to consider where you're storing your backups. With this concept here, you don't have to deal with that. Microsoft is handling that for you. All you need to decide is what retention policy you want. So then you can decide exactly what tier you decide you would prefer to go with. All right? Um, Jason, any questions so far? Or we're good. Yeah, there's actually a couple questions that have come in, and let me uh, mm -hmm. just get the first one here. When using Azure DB with an Elastic Pool, there's a u there's no use statement. How do you modify SQL code that used to get a collection of databases on a server through the steps and steps through the set of databases, applying the updates to structure or collecting, you know, ac across a collection of databases? Okay, so el Elastic Pool. I didn't want to touch on that, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll respond to that person separately because then those who are not familiar with the Elastic Pool might be lost, All right? Um, so I'll deal with the Elastic Pool question separately. Anything on terms of the stuff that we've talked about so far? Um, yeah, when you restore from a point in time, can you restore to the existing database or do you have to switch to using a different database name? Um, Last time I checked, you had to use a different database name, so I can't remember if they changed that because I know it was something that we talked about um, getting. Um, I'll have to verify that, but last time I checked, you had to use a different database name. Okay. Okay, right. cool. There's one other question, but I'm going to hold off on that one for a little bit. All right. No problem. All right. So... Um, Century one point in time restore, and I talked about high availability. Um, this slide here is to kind of highlight to you that even though Microsoft does some level of high availability for you, you, the user, still have some level of decision making to make, or at least actions to do as well. So even though, yes, Microsoft says they're, they're able to do these things for you, right, you still have work to do, and you still have to understand what's happening behind the scenes. So as a as a user, right, this is where, again, your capabilities are, are necessary. So you'd see, for example, um, planning the database prioritization, region selection the discovery for disaster recovery, um, initialization, the geo restore to selected areas, and also um, initializing the failover for geo replicated databases. So basically, the options available to you on the Azure SQL DB, right, is something called Geo Restore, which allows you to restore your database to different um, locations in the Azure region. Um, you also have Geo Replication, which allows you to have copies of your databases in different regions in Azure. 
right? Of course, even though Microsoft can do this for you, you still are the one that have to decide on your strategy in terms of where you want to select to go um, based on your business criteria, as well as um, what, what databases you're going to do it for and where you're going to do it to, right? So the Active Geo replication, as I say here, it allows all service tiers. Now, this is an older slide, so it has this premium RS, which was a preview mode that no longer exists. Um, but it allows you up to four rep rep readable secondaries, and as you can see, at any Azure region. Um, recovery time, less than an hour. Recovery point objective, less than, fifth, less than five minutes. Right? And of course, the failure is on demand right now. So this here the, dealt with the high availability options. What I'm going to get into now is some of the performance tuning options. Um, again, right now we're in 2018, which means all the capabilities that you've seen in SQL Server 2016 and SQL Server 2017 currently exist in the cloud. Right? Azure SQL DB, of course, will have not all of them, but most of them exist on Azure SQL DB as well. Query Store is one of the new things that came out, um, was highlighted in 2016, and is a way of helping you understand what's going on on the environment when it comes to performance without you having to be this database admin that understands a set of different DMVs to go and pull a set of different information. Um, you're able to find out information such as regress queries, um, up them, how to optimize your ad, ad hoc workload. Um, what it does, it collects telemetry about your queries and then gives you recommendations on what you need to do to improve it in a nutshell. Um, the Query Performance Insight uh, gives, you in, gives you a graphical description of how your CPU is going, how it is your your different um, resources are being handled on the Azure SQL DB, right? And then you can also drill down into it. I'll just show you how to get to that point in the demo. I, however, do not have any database with a set of queries being done on it because it's my personal account and I only have $150 per month, which means that I can't keep stuff up too long in there because I run up my bill very fast. But I will definitely show you how to get to this point where you could see um, some of your performance insights off of the Azure SQL DB. SQL Database Advisor. Um, now, as I have said before, and Jason is a guy that uses indexing a lot, um, I believe that indexing, and Jason could always jump in if he wants to, indexing is a job for not only admins, but also developers. And as such, um, understanding what indexes to create is no one, one duty, and it is not a one-man show. It is a team effort based on the developer as well as the administrator. Um, while these tools help you understand what indexes you have, what you should create, what you should drop, um, decision making will still solely be with the users, which is you, the admin or developer, and your team to decide on what to use. So even though there's this feature that advises you about your indexes and how to improve your performance, it is still your decision to decide what what to create and what not to create and what to drop. Right. Threat detection right now. Um, again, security is a big deal in Azure SQL DB and one of the the nice capabilities they have is the ability to actually turn on a threat detection so you could actually see if anyone is trying to access your system via the web application, trying to do things that they're not supposed to do, and it will alert you about this. Um, if you had to do this on-premise, this would probably require you to, to have some kind of third party Right, even though you could turn it on on the SQL Server side, um, most people will have to have it from a network level as well. Um, you don't have to worry about that because, of course, you're kind of leveraging Microsoft Network and they will give you this insights when you turn on the threat detection. Auditing. 
another feature again that, as I said, a lot of people have been asking for. Um, simple clicker to turn on, which I'll show you how to do. Um, you have the option of configuring and tracking your logs and saying what you know you want to store it on your Azure storage account if you want. It's available in all the tiers and as I said, it's accessible via the portal. The adaptive query processing is something that was highlighted in SQL Server 2017, right? It is a, in a nutshell, it's basically a way of improving your, your, your query processing. Um, it will look at how your, your queries run and based on understanding um, what memory is necessary the type of joins being used, it will give options in terms of how to, it will actually improve how your queries run. This is built in right now into Azure SQL DB, right? It is automatically on, you don't have to go and turn it on, it's just one of the features that is there for you to leverage. Right, and now I'll just jump into the demo to show you what is available for you. Right. Close this off. Okay. So what we have here, I have a few SQL databases already created. I'm not gonna go through the process, or maybe I should go through a quick process um, to show you how it's created. But for now, I'm just gonna go into one of the databases that I have to show you where the options are. So one of the first options you see here that I want to highlight is the restore option. So from the point in time when you have your, your point in time restores happening, this is where you can actually go to restore it. Um, you see there the specify a database name and maybe I can try to use the same name, right? And you see they say the database already exists. So for the guy with the question about can you do it with the same name, the answer is no right now. All right. So that's one of the options. Um, there's a query editor. I didn't mention this here, but it's in preview mode, which is why I didn't mention it in the deck. Um, so this was annoying to me, and I'm glad that they have it. Um, what they did was I had certain machines where I had to install management studio in order to connect or run a query. In this case, with the query editor, I can just simply log in here and do a query just to verify. So I get to see my tables. And I could just say, hey, let me verify that there's data in this. But all right, so this is a cool um, preview that feature that I've in preview right now. Um, hopefully it gets really soon with some more capabilities. Um, in terms of the things that we were talking about, the auditing and threat detection. See if I can move this. So it's just a matter of turning it on. All right, and then specifying where I want my emails to be sent. Again, as I said, um, Azure SQL DB makes it very easy to implement most of these features. It's like a click, click, and done. Um, these here are some of the new security features that they implemented in SQL Server 2016 and 2017. I didn't touch on it because security is a touchy subject when it comes to cloud, so I'm leaving that alone. Um, get some information about your properties here if you want. And then we could go to the monitoring. All right. 
So we have an idea of the size of a DB. And then you could turn on the analysis to capture some of this information here that most times when you're looking to do performance tuning, you actually need this data for those who are deep divers into the database admin world. All right. Um, I'm going to touch on this health thing. Performance overview, which, as I said, I've not been doing anything on this machine, really. But what it does, it gives you the insights, similar to, like, if you ran um, your DMVs and had to assess what's going on with your system. There's a graphical way of understanding what's going on right now. Um, as it is, when you're creating a database in Azure SQL DB, you specify DTUs. DTUs is a combination of CPU, memory, input, output. Um, but here, you can get breaks down into CPU from this, this overview, as well as your data input, output. So, even though you have the DTU aspect of it, you can still get a breakdown into CPU as well. All right? And the performance automate, which is the automatic tuning, right? Um, as I mentioned, you have the ability to say, you know what, you guys know better than me, Microsoft SQL Server, I believe in you, and I think that um, whatever plan or indexes or stuff that you want to create and run and push for, fine. Um, this kind of helps with you having less performance you need to do if you believe that they are going to handle it for you. But based on the fact that they have the query store as well as the um, adaptive plan happening nowadays in SQL Server Engine, I could, I want to say guarantee, you know, I'll say 99.99% guarantee that um, what they recommend is what you need based on your workload because they will actually be using that telemetry to understand how best to adjust for your environment. Right. So another um, insights that you could get from here your top queries by CPU, by data IO. So if you're into graphs and visualizations, this, this portal now allows you to get a lot more insights on your system to help you understand what's going on in your database. This avoids you having to do a set of queries on your own. However, if you're old school and you prefer to actually still do it like that, there are still some M there are still some DMVs that you can use to get some insights. So if I go to my management studio, I'm already connected. Um, what I wanted to show was just the difference between your your Azure SQL DB. If you notice, I have just database and security here, and this one, which is my actual on-premise DB, I have a lot more options which includes a management tab where normally this is where I'll go to do my management stuff and understand what's going on. Even though there's extended events for the instance, from a database standpoint, you still have the option to do extended events for the database itself. You also have the query store op um, options here that I mentioned as available, so you can see what's going on on the system from a query source standpoint. All right. Um, again, you see security, you don't have any, you have just database on security on this level, but if you want, you can also use some DMVs to get information. The list of DMVs are available online. Um, I can always send a link so we can send it out to you so you can see what's available from a DMV standpoint. So if you're old school and still want to leverage um, the DMV side of it, you're good to go. Um, you have the extended events options as well. 
Um, so you just run through the new session wizard. I thought I had one set up. And you could get some information captured here from an extended vent standpoint as well. And you have your query store, which will also give you some insights on your system from a graphical standpoint, from a query plan standpoint. So beside the portal and seeing it from a graphical point of view, you also have your some of your standard SQL admin capabilities. Um, I told you I'll show you the scaling capability as well, which is, first of all, you would see, uh, Sorry. Uh, you see a pricing day here with the um, different standards or DTUs, right? And then if I want, I could click on it. And now I have, as I said, you have a tab now where you could adjust your DTU, right? In some cases, so for example, if I had this as 30 gigs, 20 gigs, I can move around the DTU, right? But notice my size of my data size stays the same. So for how it was is once you select um, a DTU, it means a level of DTUs or a certain size of your database, um, you have a lot more flexibility now with your adjustments. Okay, um, I'm trying to run through as much as possible. As I said, this is a level 100. Um, if you want a deeper dive or deeper understanding, um, we can do that for you. Just highlight what, what features or capabilities you're interested in. Um, I just wanted to highlight that these are, these are available to you because a lot of people, even though they have Azure SQL database, they don't go through the options to understand what is there on the option side for them. Um, the last thing that I said I would touch is stretch DB. Now, um, as I said, I really like this this feature. Um, this feature was the concept behind it is the ability to have cool storage on Azure. And for those who are familiar with having that you have some policies that says you need to have like seven years of data, 10 years of data. You know how frustrating, frustrating it is when it comes to your size of your DBs, um, queries taking on, um, just the management of it on the whole is just difficult. And this now offered you the ability to actually take your cold data from your local database and move it to Azure SQL DB and have your hot data remain on-premise. But when you write a query, right, there's no changes to your query. What it does is it, it knows, okay, here what, I need this data from the cold data, let me stretch across there, and then you have uh, additional um, plan being created to actually access this data on the Azure SQL database to bring it back. So your cost of your data, your storage now is less, or supposedly to be less, on-premise, your performance should be improved, and the fact is you have this data readily accessible, so if it is you need to do any kind of auditing, you need to provide any kind of report or information, you get that done. Um, last year, or this year, we had some meetings with Microsoft, and a lot of customers have been complaining because what happened is when you actually do the process to the stretch DB, you don't get the option to select the size of your Azure DB. And because of that, um, it means that your course could actually be much higher than if you have it on a local database on-premise, which goes against the whole, the whole value of it, right? Um, I know Microsoft is was considering how to adjust that, um, but because I have it in the description, I said I'll run through it. So, of course, um, using my on-premise database here, I'm going to use my AdventureWorks, um, my AdventureWorks DW, and say task, 
you see stretch, enable. I'm using SQL Server 2017, by the way. So if you see anything different, it's because it's 2017 I'm using. I don't know where my 2016 instance went. Um, what it's going to do is going to decide on, OK, um, what is going to check the tables, see what's available, decide on what to use. Um, you see it says it has some errors. So some some of them, they say an entire table. Reason being is because I don't use it. So when it's deciding, OK, what is hot and what is cool, everything is cool for me because I haven't been using any of these really. All right. Um, so once I select that and I say, yeah, that's what I want to move with, right? They ask me to sign in. And once I sign in, they ask me what subscription I want to use. I have the choice of creating a new server or using an existing one. Of course, make sure you choose the right region. So I'm in East US. Um, I could create a new one or I could create an existing one and choose one of my existing one, log in with it. And then they'll ask me for credentials to create a database master key. Um, then they'll ask me what IP address I'm trying to access it from. I, if I'm in a company, of course, I could specify a subnet range because I'm using my local laptop. I'm just going to use my current IP. And then I say finish, and it's going to do it, right? Now, this is like a cooking show. So while that is in the oven, I'll show you that I already stretched the database already, which is AdventureWorks DW. I'm sorry, AdventureWorks here. So if you notice, you see like a kind of cloud um, icon here instead of the normal database. And if you look at my cool server database, I have this RDA AdventureWorks with a set of, hex, a set of hexadecimals um, values here. Um, which then says, I cannot do it because it's a stretch DB, right? So if I go properties on this, I should get an error saying unknown edition stretch. And if I go to my edition, my, I'm sorry, my portal, you would see it here, a different icon again from the normal SQL DB. Um, Azure SQL DB because it's a stretch database. So basically what it did is I like, copy across all the all the data across to the cloud. Um, I didn't leave anything on premise because I have no hot data. So when I run a query now, it's going to run a query across there. Um, if you notice the pricing here, this is the issue here. You see stretch DS of 100 on the find DTUs, right? Which, you know, is like, what does that mean? Um, and then when you go to it and you say properties, right? You see max size 240 terabyte, and then you see 750 DTUs, which um, cost wise should be a lot of money. Um, so, this is one of the issues, or I'll say the main issue with it. Um, the concept behind it is pretty good. So, once Microsoft kind of works out that kink, um, I think it should be much more suitable for benefiting the business, benefiting you as a administrator or developer. So with that, I would like to wrap up um, and then see if we can handle any questions that is available. All right, yeah, we do have a few other questions here. The first one is, is how does the older Azure SQL DB compare in features and cost to the recently announced managed Azure SQL instance? Manage instance is, now, first of all, I have to go on marketing information. And reason being is that even though I'm an MVP, the preview was like so subscribed that I actually do even have access to the preview. So whatever I know about the manage instance is based off of marketing. Very sorry. Um, but what I understand from it, it's supposed to give you a lot more admin capabilities, so you should be able to do um, not 100% on-premise, on-premise stuff, but a lot more options. I, I can't say for sure what are those features, um, 
of course you're still not going to be manage your you're not going to manage your mdf or your ldf and stuff but maybe you have the ability to do jobs for example on it again just off of marketing information i haven't been able to try it as yet um from a licensing standpoint i understand that you could take your on-premise licenses and utilize it for your managed instance all right and then for the second question that we have here i see sync to other databases can you perform tradi traditional transactional replication between Azure D DBs? And if so, can you use the same SSMS tools, i.e. replication monitor? Um, no, I have not. Well, the only side with the option that they highlight is the rep the Jira replication. Um, the, the only time I've seen them highlight transactional replication is if you're going to move data from on-premise to the cloud. I haven't seen an option to say you can do transactional replication from Azure SQL DB to Azure SQL DB. All right. And the tool-wise, definitely not, because as you can see in the list of options, um, I think my screen is still shared, right? Yep, it's still shared. Right. So in the set of options, you'll see all you have is security and databases. Um, even in the database, um, you're not going to have any options to say, well, can you can can you utilize any transactional replication tools? All right. And then the last book, I mean, the last uh, question that we have here is, can we mention some some region, not current one, while creating DB stretch? How important is it to mention your current own region? Um, I'm, I'm not. Ex just to over that question, sorry, repeat the question. Sure. Can we mention some region, not the current one, while creating a, a stretch DB? How important is it to mention the region? So I think the question is, is can you, you stretch between two regions? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I... I I'm trying to understand the question from that standpoint because, like, for example, okay, so I mentioned that the truth is I'm not in East US. I just select East US as my region, seeing that that's what I used for my last set of DBs. But if I wanted, I could have stretched the West US or Australia if I wanted. I just have to create the silver there and then say, okay, I'm going to stretch to that location. Um, however, remember, with stretch is only on premise to cloud, there's no cloud to cloud stretch. So right now you can't take an Azure SQL DB and try to stretch it to a Azure SQL DB. Um, so in the options in the wizard, when you go into the wizard, you would have seen that I selected my location. Um, but in that location, you could select any location Azure-wise. Um, all you need to do, however, is of course create a server. So um, if you're familiar with Azure SQL DB, for, for those who are, you'll understand what I mean. For those who are not, um, like a normal SQL Server database, you have to install an instance and create a database. In Azure SQL DB, you start off by creating the DB and then they give you the option to select a server or create a server. When you're creating the server, you specify where, what region, Azure region, you want to create that server. And once you do that, right, you can then create databases there. So in the wizard, if you don't have a server created in a region, you could just select the region and then they will ask you to create the server and then they will automatically create the database for you. Because if you realize when I went through the wizard, they didn't give me an option to specify the name, which means they will automatically give me a name when they're done. So I didn't select this, this RDA AdventureWorks name. Um, and I don't know if this other one is finished as yet. It is. So if you notice, I can just um, refresh this now. And you'd see again, they created a name for me. So the only thing I could do really in the wizard is specify which location and then create a server or use an existing server if I have one in that location. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, sounds great. All right, and the uh, next question that we have here is how do we ensure that we have high, avail high availability with our production databases? Um, so, in terms of Microsoft is doing high availability or in terms of you doing it, so I have another both cases, right? 
um, Microsoft Full SL SLA concept is because they provide some level of high availability. Granted, it's not something that you can access. So you can access their copies. Their, that copies is for them to ensure that they can bring it back up and give you that SLA. But in a sense, it's some level of high, avail high availability that you can leverage um, to improve your business continuity. That's one level with the Microsoft option. And the option of you implementing um, the Jira application, you specify Jira, you have to specify what regions you're going to set it up in and you can actually monitor it through the portal to see that it's actually happening as well as um, what is the state of it. So I don't have any created, but so here, is where you will want to, to set up your, so you can specify Central US for example, right? But of course then you have to go and create your, your server there and then once you create your server there, you go through the next steps, right? You see your, second, your secondary type is only readable and you create the next steps and you'll get the Jiro, Jiro replication happening here and then you can monitor it from this location itself. All right, and then the the last question that we have uh, time for today, uh, and I'm going to restate this one from how it was written because I think I, I can help on uh, getting it answered how they're looking for. Uh, can you back up an Azure SQL DB and restore it to another SQL Server instance? Can you back up an Azure SQL DB and restore it to another SQL instance? Yeah. Well, you can't back up. Azure SQL DB, Microsoft does that for you. You can request your backups, however, um, and then use those backups to restore it to uh, on-premise if you want. But in terms of restoring it to the uh, Azure SQL DB, you have the option that I specified where you go to your server and you say, uh, or you could click on the database itself and you could say restore and then you could specify from your backups that you have here to restore it. So um, you personally can back it up. You can ask Microsoft for the backups or there's also an option that's available in the where is it? Where is it? I just had it here. My mind is there's an option where you can actually um, specify that you want to send backups to another location as well. Uh, Jason, do you remember that offhand? I can't remember where it is. I don't offhand. It's been a little bit since I went in there. And actually, the person that asked the question was actually wanted to clarify that that they're they're actually thinking. Um, discussing between two PaaS servers, so between two SQL Azure DB instances. SQL Azure, uh, yeah, or Azure, or SQL Azure on Azure on Azure VM. No, um, both from platform as a service perspective. Oh, both as as SaaS databases. Um, yeah, the backup and they'll have to do the restore option here. Um, I think in there's an option. That yeah, I think can you can actually state what, where you want it to be restored to. Right, with the point in, with the, sorry, let me just jump back to it. I was looking for this location file. Um, with the restore option, when they're restoring it, they could specify um, a target, um, sorry, I'm using the, the one here. Because I'm using this server, I think they have to create a new server in the target location that they want, yep. and then point in time restore and then specify it. Right. Right. Um, there was an option, I don't know if it's changed or if it's moved, but there was an option where you could actually get copies of your backup and send it to um, like a blob storage. Yep. Um, and those, from there you could take those, pull it down and restore it to um, your on-premise DBs if you want or even uh, Azure as SQL Server DB instance on an Azure VM. Um, but yeah, 
with respect to SAS to SAS. Um, you could restart on the same server like how I'm doing here, or you could create a new server in a new location and then just click point and restore and specify the location of the backup that you have and restore it. All right, and then the uh, last thing that we have here is um, one 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 of the people, one of the folks listening today, Eric. He uh, said you can actually export the DB to Azure Blob and then restore it on premise. And I'm going to just share out in a chat to, to everyone the link that he uh, sent me that you can do that with. Okay. So that's going to show up there if anyone wants to grab that. And at this point, we are at the top of the hour, and so going to wrap things up here and thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Nigel, for your presentation. If anyone is interested in presenting to us in the future, feel free to uh, send out an email or just go over to the cloud.sqlpass.org website and fill out our uh, call for speakers. And thanks again, yeah. everyone. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. And goodbye.